This poem is called Perfect Vision. These ones and zeros cannot cage the pains of our so digital age, the passive progressive games we play on visual minorities. We're all the same, I hear them say. They can't see color, I can't place blame. They close their eyes to escape shame again, 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 again. Convenient all that they can't see, the violence and brutality. They're blind to facts and histories that would fuel their guilt and misery. Behind closed eyes, they've painted me into a world I never see. It's bleach applied so liberally that it coats and claims all I could be. I hate those eyes and I know it's wrong. And my mother taught me to be strong and my family warned this road was long. And that is why I have become the one who battles mysteries who won't be bleached from history, who share tales of adversity in hopes that now you all might see that to build a world of open minds, our allies can't be colorblind. Thank you. Thank you for that. So welcome everyone who's just joining us. That was Tando Mark McCarthy. Um, he is our guest today. Thanks for joining us, uh, Tandiwe. Um, for the third episode of the Young Artist Spotlight with myself in the NTR uh, of Woven Cultures. Uh, so Tandewa is a spoken word poet and writer based in Fredericton, New Brunswick. How are you today? I'm doing good. It's Friday. Can't complain. <laughs> yeah, it's warm. We were talking about this earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Warm. We're all secretly wearing shorts in our Zoom meetings is what yeah. we were saying. You just can't see. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier for a lot of people who may not know how I heard about uh, his poem is, or his, Tandua's work was because of the youth action gathering at Aberfest in Moncton. Was that last year or the year before? Last October, yeah, yeah. Yeah, last October. And uh, ever since then, I kind of want to hear more of that work it's so powerful as we've heard in the in the beginning um so since uh, you know i'm familiar with your work a little bit um but for those viewers who aren't uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself your background and all that i'm a seventh generation african canadian that means that my mother her grandmother and her great-great-grandmother and several greats ago, McCarthy's been here in New Brunswick. And uh, I'm, I've always been creative. And uh, yeah, I'd say recently I just graduated UNB. So that's great. That's awesome. Um, what, what got you into poetry uh, to start with? Oh, that's a good question. I would say last year, so every, my birthday is February 9th and February is Black History Month. And so all my life I've struggled with how to celebrate myself and my blackness on this month when everyone is saying, oh, how are you gonna celebrate Black History Month? And I'd be like, uh, I'm gonna celebrate my birthday. I'm not sure how to celebrate my blackness. And it was having that inner dialogue with myself on how do I really explain to myself or others what my blackness means to me that I kind of came upon the tools of poetry and really dived back into them. And I mean, it started last February and it's just been a roller coaster ride ever since. And uh, that's why all my poetry is very heavily uh, black community focused because that seems to, it's, a part of my soul I've neglected that's now coming out on the page and vocally. Tell us a little bit about that. What, uh, what was it that made you sort of struggle with, you know, celebrating your blackness before you started poetry and all, all these other art forms that you're doing? Well, I would say internally, my family always raised me to be a good person. 
not a black person, but a good person. Be kind, be respectful, work hard. All my aunts and uncles always taught me good ethics and morals to really care about your friends, to be able to go above and beyond for people that support you. And so my color never factored into that. And when I was in elementary school and growing up, all of my friends were white and they would never mention my color. In fact, many of them would tease and say, oh, you're the whitest person I know because I had no, no attachment to what their vision of blackness was. I was just Tondaway. And I make the joke now with my friends that I've just been Tondaway for so long, it now occurred to me, oh, I'm also black. And uh, so that's, that's why right now all my poetry comes out so powerful because I'm, I'm reliving my whole life through my poetry as a black man and seeing all the things that I've gone through through another lens of, Oh yeah, if people saw me as black, but I, I just saw myself as Conway. And how do I now speak to my teenage years, my years as a child, my K through 12 years as a black person and that's through the poetry. So you grew up in Fredericton or other parts of Fredericton? Okay, and we'll yeah, just- Doc was the only black kid in the whole elementary school wow. and uh, the kids used to tease me about it. And so my mother's name is Mary. And they would say, Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was black as coal. And like, I went through some terrible, horrible racist moments. And they would affect me, not because of the color of my skin, but more because I was being ousted from socializing or playing with other kids. It never occurred to me that because I look different, I cannot be fun to hang out with or socialize with. I've always had a very analytical, fact-based mind. So as I'm trying to piece this apart analytically, I never opened into the emotions of it. And now as I look emotionally, that's where the fuel for the poetry is. So when you realize that um, people saw you as a certain way because of the color of your skin, how old were you and like, how did you feel? Well, I mean, there were several times growing up when I would just say that, oh, this must be because I'm black. But that was more of a joke because I really had no idea what I was saying. Because I, again, I was raised taunt away. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't raised black, male, and then Tondway, I just live my life experiences so fully that it doesn't occur to me to piece out what's my culture, what is my gender, what is all these other things, and how did that incorporate into the intersectionality of myself? I really just kind of react in the moment to how things are happening. So, yeah, just wow. I hope that answered your question. I'm gonna be going off track a lot during this. So okay. Everybody, a heads up, I'm a ranter. So we'll be going down several memory lanes and there's no breaks. <laughs> I mean, identity for, for me, I grew up in so many different countries and I saw myself through, through people's eyes in different ways. And identity is such an important thing for me. Um, and then, you know, coming to North America, like noticing that, okay, my Asian-ness is probably seen as a different, the way I approach things are, seen as different because of uh, because of how I look or what I believe in and stuff like that um yeah I mean it's it's a strong in your poetry at least it's a strong influence right yeah absolutely the the realization that people saw me as black first toned away second and where I've always been toned away first several other things and then blackness was kind of at the bottom of that list of what I thought was important for me to present because I didn't know how. So I was like, I'll just be a good person. I'll be a kind person. I'll look out for myself and my friends and they can judge me off of that. It turns out society saw me as a color first instead of the actions that I did. So mm. I want to dive into another performance of your poem uh, shortly, but can before we do that, can we can you talk about the first poem that you were talking, uh, that you performed? It was, you talk about color blindness there. Yes. And so that comes to the fact where 
a lot of my friends first meeting them, they would say they don't see color. And this whole conversation we've had, I'd say, speaks to that poem in that in trying to say that they see my humanity without my culture, they remove my culture from me. And so really what they're doing is saying, I can only acknowledge you as human if I take the blackness from you. And that's me doing you a favor. And so I never learned, no one, none of my friends ever had a conversation with me about like blackness, or I really like that you have like a black family or black culture, none of that. It was always, oh yeah, let's hang out. Let's eat, let's go for a walk. Let's, you know, watch movies, play video games. And so I never, that, that tactic of colorblindness as a way to respect people really gave me some emotional scars that I've been working through. And it does far more harm than it does good. And that's what comes out in the poem. In order for us to build a better world, our allies can't be colorblind. How about we recognize that people have differences that are valuable first, and we are all human. We can do that and not take anything away and like, we, the world is better for acknowledging that we are all different and still all the same and wonderful. Yeah, I actually, uh, the work with Woven Cultures that we've been doing is kind of to promote uh, diversity and inclusion and the, the positive uh, impact that it brings to, to, to uh, communities. And too often we do hear like, yeah, but we're all the same, but all, our experiences are not the same. <laughs> no, no. Exactly. Like there was a teacher actually who I met and she said, you know what? Um, and she said something so simple yet so profound. She was like, diversity is normal. I'm like, yes, girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So what's, what's the next one that you're going to, you're going to do? Uh, this one is off my name called the one black poet. So that is the name of this poem. To be or not to be, the blackness that is part of me, to champion culture quietly or sing its virtues filled with glee. It seems the choice is not with me, for I am black because you see this hair I choose a careful key, this skin that yells what cultures be on any known reality. It's plain the blackness inside me. But what of names I shall not tease, but share intimately, like birds and bees. The one black poet needs no decree. My presence speaks quite well for me. Just scan this room if you should seek the accuracy my title speaks. The conversations it won't let sleep of visual minorities, of those most extraordinary, chained with burdens less than merry, cloaked in blindness we all carry it's why my voice can seem so scary i will not hide so i can be that one black poet you all now see thank you thank you so much for that speaking of the one black poet <laughs> i did like we didn't plan what poem you're gonna you know, do and what questions I'm going to do, but it just so happens that I had this question in mind. I want to know what has been your experience as an artist, um, as a poet, uh, you know, trying to promote your work or even trying to get, get your work out there? Uh, this is kind of going in as an artist, it's almost reversed because other artists see me as black first. And they see, oh, I have a unique story to tell. That's what fuels my art. And so the name, The One Black Poet, came from the fact that as I'm learning, I've been, I'm here marking all the organizations. I was at a national writing conference, Sage Hill. I got the mug and you were there for 10 days and we all worked on poetry, writing, nonfiction, everything. And it was a good crash course and I won my placement there. I was the only black person there and the only person from Atlantic Canada. When I, I was, I signed up for our New Brunswick Catapult program, ArtsLink, 
eight weeks training teaching you how to turn your art into a business, how to make money for it. I won my placement there. I was the only black person there. And as I look on these memberships and I see I'm one of five, maybe one of 10 black people, it's always in the conversation that, oh, you're a poet? Oh, I've never, I've never like a black poet. That's so cool. And so I gave the name, I'm the one black poet when really there's dozens. I've met so many other black poets in New Brunswick, but none of them are in the spaces I've been in. So to other people in those spaces, I'm the one black poet they've seen. So <laughs> the, the name is just a, a fun riff off the conversation I keep having. It's like, yeah. oh, a spoken word poet. Now that your stuff is so powerful and oh, your blackness, yes, the diversity and all these check marks they hit as they go through the conversation. I'm like, I'm not the only black poet in New Brunswick. There's tons. I'm just the one you see right now. And uh, so that's why I gave myself that name. And that's how I kind of feel about the art sector in New Brunswick. I haven't seen my color as a barrier to get anything. In fact, it has benefited me because the art world, I find, has been very open to allowing me space to uh, speak up. If I can continue this conversation, during Black History Month, our poet laureate, Jenna Lynn Albert, is always searching for diverse voices because as the poet laureate, every other Monday for a council meeting, she reads a poem and she can choose to read her poem and that's all that she can do if she wants. But she always makes a point to get indigenous poets, poets from the LGBTQ, black poets. And so she invited me in Black History Month to personally perform one of my poems there. And I, with that opportunity, so many other things have bounced off of that. And so for once, to go off, it almost seems like I'm being valued for my blackness for the first time in society because of a poet. So it's kind of a little heroic story that I lean into my culture instead of just analytical Tondway, be a good person, be a good person who is also proud of being black. So much more comes to me through just anything I do. So it's, it's leaning, very poetic, I'll say. Yeah, leaning into who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you, what would you say to those people that you meet in those art spaces where it's still your to them you're still the one black poet, um, and honestly in many many spaces uh, I can tell in 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 the in the industries that I worked in, um, it's it's not that diverse yet. <laughs> yeah. No. What what's what what kind of message would you kind of tell people and how? to be more inclusive, like you were saying, the Poet Laureate in, in Fredericton, right? Um, that was really trying um, to have those diverse voices. What can other people do? I would honestly, if these people, these Black artists have Facebook pages or Instagrams or anything, share that. Share their new work. Tell people that you like it. Always support local artists over people from like other countries or anything because you have a closer connection. I think as we learn about society in this pandemic and we've kind of gotten closer to each other as we're keeping more socially distant, we're learning like the people right next to us are so important and the businesses right next to us are so important and the schools and our friends and their kids and we kind of start within ourselves and we build outward and the way our culture is built we kind of support people that are millions of miles away and that our money has very little impact on people that are closest to us. They don't support the stories. If I support a black artist or any artist here in New Brunswick, that money goes into the economy. It makes their life better. It helps our art. So I would really say the first step is building awareness and having conversations that there are black artists of many disciplines. And uh, that's that's kind of what I said. I had I was on a big thing where I wanted to start a, a black artist organization. And I know there's been a lot of interest in that in the black community to start that. And uh, just as a better way to promote and market. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to get into what new projects you're getting in uh, or you're working on right now. But I'd like to invite you to perform another poem um, if you have one. Yes. Uh, 
This is the one probably everybody knows. This one's called respect. Swayed entertainment, their games meant to change us, to bruise, break, and blame us, but don't let them contain us or evict the nameless, for it's aimless to shame us. Respect. Government tries, but it can't see our resources, our dreams. Oh, we have time, but it is not free, for it has always been costly. From the ship sailing black seas with rat slaves and disease, respect. No. I won't go down gently. This fist ain't made friendly. This handshake built deadly to disrupt your memory and shut down your spending. Melody is malicious. Respect. From all you've been sending, DNA still mending. Destructive beginnings, hope tested, still bending. Served plates full of hate, no escape. It's unending, I push and I shout, cause I am done being friendly. My hair's not your pet, and my skin was never candy. Respect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I notice uh, the way you perform your uh, poems, the voice and all that, where does that come from? I have no idea. <laughs> completely, this is, I've always been a very dramatic, loud speaker, mm -hmm. and poetry and spoken word, like I've always been prone to rants and being long-winded, and spoken word poetry is kind of the perfect storm for a tool I can use to really enunciate and articulate who I am. It's just a happy accident that there's a way for me to promote and express myself that's a perfectly acceptable modality already set. And uh, I, I just found it very late in life. Who knew is what I keep saying. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, what, uh, what projects are you working on now? On a book of poetry that'll collect my essays. And other than that, just poetry and uh, trying to get more videos out it is really, oh, wait, my, gee, sorry, I'm so scatterbrained. Uh, my poetry workshop, the Poetry for Mental Health, that's the big thing I'm working on right now. It's, I uh, graduated from uh, UNB with a degree in recreation and sports studies, which is a terrible name. It should be called Management and Community Studies, and I, my branch in that is wellness. So I went through Holland College, I got a diploma in kinesiology, I worked for three years as a personal trainer, then I went to school and got a couple more kinesiology credits before learning about societal wellness, how income, gender, education, childhood, like daycares, how all these societal things affect our health, even more than if we go for a run every day, how close you are to daycares as you're raising a family affects your stress levels. And uh, more than food and movement, it seems, how our cities are built and the services given to us very much affects our health and our ability to recover and our susceptibility to disease. So to unpack that, I think poetry is a great way to kind of reflect and uh, work through what in society is kind of weighing down on you. What is going on that you might not even be aware of and you think you need to go to the gym four times a week or you think you just need to eat more kale but maybe there's just something else inside that's much more tangible and approachable that you could get. And I think poetry is a great way to do that. And I'm building this workshop around uh, that exploration of these things. So is the, is the intention sort of to um, get more people to express themselves through poetry regarding like mental wellness and stuff? Yes, I truly believe that being able to speak and be vulnerable and sharing poetry and having other people like give you positive feedback on it. And when you say, so, cause poetry is almost like the last free space for absolute expression. Being able to be a spoken word poet, I could say anything in any way and it could be seen just as, oh, that's his art. You can remove that from the person. So to use that 
freedom and that protected space to explore who you are and say things about society you don't like and things you wish would change and have other people acknowledge that. I think that's just something so valuable we don't get in our internet digital era where our communication is so far removed from any personal uh, nourishment. Mm. Mm. So for people who don't know where to find you and to follow your work with regard to the uh, wellness or any other work that you're doing, your videos, where can we find you on social media? I would say the one black poet, that's the number not spelt out on Instagram and my Facebook page. And uh, I keep those updated with anything I have coming up that's planned. And uh, yeah, that would be more than enough. And always support your other local poets and all that too. And, uh, awesome. Uh, yeah. well, thank you so much, Tandue. Um, this was awesome. I, I've loved the poems that you've shared with us and I've loved the uh, discussion that we've had. I'd love to go on and on and on <laughs> about identity and all that and all the issues that we're seeing in the world right now that's uh, weighing us down. Um, and I'd love to close with um, your last poem. Well, this one's new and we'll see if I can get through it. But this was the poem that got me on CBC and Information Morning and all this jazz. It was, uh, my 15 seconds of fame that I've thankfully done and I can go back to making new poems. This poem is called Enough. <clears throat> Yo, this, how they treat us, how black will they beat us? Blue knees on my neck while the white stare defeated, no love. In these streets then, I'm shaking and seething. My culture been boiled, it's time for force feeding. So now all you eating, this hate you've been breeding with ignorant acts, all your egos been needing. All my life I've been pleading for whites to believe in just one simple fact, I'm a damn human being. The skin that you see in just fills you with hate, so you take and you take until all cities break from the dawn of his story. This tune's been the same, cause you rape and you kill while the rest get enslaved. Well, this game that you play ain't gonna win, not today, cause we done doing work for a culture that makes grand excuses for crimes and wicked news shows that just broadcast more hate so our people don't know how to dream or to grow, how to love or to share. All the things that you sell us just keep us in fear. So damn your whole system, the refund is here and you'll take it all back and your checks will not clear. I'm too angry to cry, I'm too sad not to scream. I'm a living nightmare in a white culture dream. Thank you.